Good morning and welcome to our webinar on researching your military ancestors at New South Wales State Archives. Before we begin, we just acknowledge the country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So today we're going to be looking at military records, military ancestors in the New South Wales State Government Archives. We're going to start with a quick acknowledgement of the service records that are held at other organisations. And then we're going to look at the guides and indexes on our website, the early colonial period, which is really that 1788 to 1856 time period, the years of responsible government up to 1900, and then post-Federation records from 1901. So first off, I'd just like to really shout out to both the Australian War Memorial and the National Archives of Australia. These websites are probably your most useful and immediate sources of information for service records of Australia. So World War I Army and Navy records, World War II Army, Navy and Air Force records, and some post-World War II records held at the National Archives of Australia, but the Department of Defence also maintains some records as well. And the Australian War Memorial, which holds a lot of information about um, our various wars that and conflicts that Australia has been involved in. So those are very, two very important websites for your military ancestor and service record research. So the National Archives of Australia actually also holds some New South Wales military records before and after 1901. So we've just got some research suggestions listed here for you. And as I said, we are recording this, so it will be uploaded to our website next week. The National Archives web address is naa.gov.au um, and they hold military records pre-1900 that were transferred to the Commonwealth in 1901 and later. Some search suggestions include in record search, which is their catalogue, using the advanced search option and looking for agency SP820 and putting an asterisk after the zero and you'll come up with quite a few different agencies that transferred records from New South Wales to the National Archives. There's also CA1272, which is the Chief Secretary, and there are some pre-1900 New South Wales military records listed there. Um, the agency CA5967 for the Volunteers Naval Brigade, and then the series C3170 for records of various New South Wales Infantry Battalions between 1885 and 1921. So they're just some suggestions of records in the National Archives of Australia's collection that can be helpful when you're looking for New South Wales pre-1900 and after 1901 military records. So moving on to the New South Wales State Archives website, we have some places that are useful for your research. So our web address is records.nsw.gov.au and our most useful points of access are our online indexes and our research A to Z, our webinars, as well as going straight to our catalogue. So you'll see I've put two circles on the web page there. So we've got the circle to our quick links to our online indexes, research A to Z and our webinars. And then down the bottom, there's another circle to our research A to Z. So a few ways you can get into looking at topics of research about the collection. And just above that bottom circle, you'll see a big white box that says search. And that's the search box to our catalogue. So the catalogue is the records that list the records in our collection, sometimes file by file, sometimes series, sometimes you'll actually see copies of records in there and we will look at some of those today. And then there's also details about the government agencies that created those records and that can help you identify where to look to find information. 
So if I clicked on the Research A to Z button, that would take us to our research topic guides. So they're guides that we've put together on different subjects and they can help you identify records that might be useful for your research. Because we're looking at military ancestors today, I've picked out our military and war guides and you can look under different headings in the research A to Z. So things like defence establishments and fortifications, military and war, railways and railway workers, soldiers settlement, World War I and World War II. And so you can see this is the guide page for our military and war. And we've got various things listed there from the Anzac centenary, for war, military personnel, soldier settlement and war and Australia. Now, if I was to think about the online indexes, there's also a subject heading for military and war. So we've got quite a few employee type records that relate to as relate to the military, but you can also look under the headings railways and railway workers, soldier settlement and World War I. And all of those will take you to indexes that relate to military people in the New South Wales State Archives collection. Now the early colonial period we think of as 1788 to 1856. So in terms of military records at this time, British military units had responsibility for external defence in New South Wales as required, as well as establishing law and order within the settlement. There are service records such as muster rolls and pay lists, and these are records of the British government, though they're not actually the New South Wales State Government archives. I've just got a little tiny example there of the muster book and pay list from the 3rd Regiment East Kent Buffs, and this comes from the Australian Joint Copying Project. Digital copies of military records of the British military are available on the National Archives UK website. So that's nationalarchives.gov.uk. Once you're on their website, if you look for research guides, free online records, digital microfilm, you'll be able to track down the muster, list, muster books and pay lists. Some of those records are also on Ancestry. So there's the database UK, British Army Muster Books and Pay Lists, 1817, 1812 to 1817. So that's another place you can go. And the National Library of Australia, NLA, have also digitised records from the Australian Joint Copying Project. Now, the Australian Joint Copying Project is a collection of material from the United Kingdom government departments that related to Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific between 1560 and 1984. So hugely useful for doing research, particularly for, say, the British military who were serving in Australia. Um, and the, they have digitised all of the Australian Joint Copying Project microfilms on the National Library of Australia's website. So I found it was actually useful just to do a Google search for British Army muster rolls and pay lists and follow the links to the National Library of Australia's guide to the records of the War Office as filmed by the AJCP. And that was the way that I actually found the copy of the document that I've got up on the screen there. And there's also copies of the Australian Joint Copying Project microforms at the Mitchell Library, the National Library of Australia and the other state libraries around Australia. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get access to this material these days. In New South Wales and in our state archives collection, we have the records of the New South Wales Colonial Secretary. Now these records are important because they tell us about people in New South Wales generally, but in this context about people who served in the military in New South Wales. So if we think about the governor, he was the commander in chief of the colony and he had the direction and superintending control of every person and every act, civil, military, settlers and convicts under his government and in the execution of which he has to attend to the duty of every civil officer. So the governor was in control in New South Wales. Now, the secretary to the governor, later the colonial secretary, had the custody of all the official papers and records belonging to the colony. He transpired, 
transcribed public dispatches, made out the grants, the leases and the other public colonial instruments, etc., and so forth. So the colonial secretary recorded transactions relating to the colony and the government in New South Wales. So in this context of New South Wales government records, a really important collection of records because it records everything in those early days. Um, and one of the things that was actually under the control of the colonial secretary and the governor were the loyal associations and the volunteer forces. But before we get up to those, we'll just have a look at a petition here that was sent to the colonial secretary. Now, this is from a convict who was called Patrick O'Hara, and it shows details about Patrick O'Hara, the convict, his prior military service. And this prior military service information would get you back to the muster and pay lists. So Patrick O'Hara was 77 in 1810. He'd come to the colony in 1800 on the convict ship Friendship as a convict, um, and it gives details of his military service. So he'd served in the American War in the 57th Regiment, and then he was invalided from the 107th Regiment by General Hinton in the Isle of Wight. He did garrison duty in the Isle of Alderney and was a pensioner in Chelsea in the UK. And then he went back to Ireland, went to Scotland, had some unfortunate circumstances that resulted in him becoming a convict. He's now writing to the governor to request a pardon so that he can go back home and die amongst his friends. So what a wonderful letter. Gives us so much information about his background and his military history there. So when you're looking for military records in the colonial secretary's papers, think about things like the early index to the colonial secretary's papers, 1788 to 1825, which you can find on our website in our online indexes. And you can also find the entries from this index in our catalogue. And some of the things you can look under there would be the name of the individual, the regiment number, the, or regiment as a search term, defence, military, volunteer, those kinds of words. We've also got the Joan Rees Index to Convicts and Others, which covers from 1826 to 1896. And again, you could search this index by name or by keywords like regiment or defence or naval, those kinds of words. We've also got the index to the letters received by the colonial secretary relating to land, 1826 to 56, for letters from former British military personnel. So we'll see a little bit about that later on. There's an index to passengers arriving, 1842 to 55. Now, whilst they didn't record the names of individual military people, personnel arriving in the colony, the names of the regiments and the ships on which they were arrived are recorded. So if you search for R under regiment, you can find out the name of the ship and the date that a particular regiment arrived. We've also got the original indexes that were kept in the office that indexed and registered the colonial secretary's papers between the 1826 and 1900s. And you can check these under names like regiment, military, volunteer, corps, drill, defence, naval and soldier. And you can also check our catalogue for those search terms as well. And also the name of the individual that you're researching. So there's plenty of research options there. If you want to find out more about the Colonial Secretary's Papers, we've done a webinar on the Colonial Secretary's Papers, and we've also done a webinar on top numbering, which explains the filing system that they used in the Colonial Secretary's Office. Now, in the early 1800s, there were two loyal associations. These were founded by John Hunter in 1800. There was one at Parramatta and one in Sydney. And these were formed to assist British troops. They reformed in 1803 as a part-time militia and they took part in suppressing the Irish convict rebellion in 1804. And they were disbanded by Macquarie in 1810. You can search for people who were in the loyal associations in the colonial secretary's papers, 1788 to 1825. And you can use terms like the name of the person, the loyal association or volunteer. 
Here we've done a search in that particular index under volunteer and we've come up with a lot of names of people who were part of that Sydney Volunteer Association. And if we click on that details button there on the right hand side of the screen for any one of those entries, we'll be sent to our catalogue like this and you can actually view the entry in the catalogue there. So we've got John Griffiths, he was the Sergeant Major in the Loyal Sydney Volunteer Association and this list is from 1810. It tells us he came free as a Marine Sergeant Major and he came free on the Friendship. So we've got quite a bit of information to start going backwards with with John Griffiths there. Another series from the Colonial Secretary are the letters from individuals relating to land, um, 1826 to 56. So these include letters from individuals, memoranda, reports, applications, petitions and so on for the rent, grant, purchase, lease of land in the colony. Um, and from 1789, non-commissioned marine officers were entitled to receive up to 100 acres more and privates up to 50 acres more than the quantity of land allowed for convicts. Commissioned officers weren't allowed to um, and this granting of land was in place from 1792 onwards. Granting land to the ex-military is a pattern that continued in New South Wales until after World War I. So we've got a lot of letters from ex-British military requesting land grants and these can often state their regiment and show some details of their retirement and post serving lives and that information again can get you back to the British muster and pay lists. So here we've got an example which is a petition by Mary Baker and she was the widow of William Baker who was in the 102nd Regiment. She, he had been granted 100 acres at Wilberforce. Um, and the land was granted to Mary in the right of her husband um, and she's now petitioning to the colonial secretary to get that land recharted and put in her own name. So his advanced years and infirm state of health had impeded that charting and measuring of the land at the time um, and so now she needs to get her land grants confirmed. She considered the land as being chartered to her and she's already cleared about 10 acres of land she says and she now intends to build a house for herself and her children. So in those two petitions we get a little bit of a picture into the life of Mary. We find out a bit about her husband William. We know that she's living there with her children and that she's hopeful that she can stay on that land, get that land confirmed in her own name and bring her children up there even though he's passed away. Now responsible government it, we consider from 1856 and the colony of New South Wales was under its own responsible government from 1856 to 1901. The Constitution Act of 1855 brought this government to New South Wales. So that started the two Houses of Parliament that we're familiar with today. It introduced a wide range of powers over domestic matters revenue raising and land. Um, it was as a result of this process that the British government pulled out much of the funding for military and only then would pay for a fixed minimum force. Um, and under responsible government, the colonies had to pay for any additional British troops. Military properties such as barracks were transferred to the colonies and the colonies were now responsible for all the troops retained. So when we think about the military in this time period, we think about firstly at home and one of the things that the colonial government had to then take care of was coastal defence and fortifications. Um, so in the early years of the colony, the British military units had had responsibility for this external defence as well as establish law and order within the colony. So British troops withdrew in 1870 finally and at this stage colony, colonies took over for their own defence requirements. Um, New South Wales embarked on a period of building defensive fortifications, usually around concentrated 
port entrances and other points of vantage. So places like Port Jackson, Bear Island Fort, Fort Scratchley at Newcastle and the Victoria Barracks at Sydney. And after Federation, the Commonwealth took responsibility for naval and military defences in Australia. Control of a number of fortifications throughout New South Wales was assumed by the new Department of Defence. So the other side of at home was the volunteer forces. And there was a first a small volunteer force set up in 1854 during the Crimean War. These forces were unpaid and had to supply their own uniforms. In 1860, volunteer forces were established with the generally unsettled period in the Pacific region. By 1863, colonial authorities elsewhere requested further assistance from Australia. So New Zealand, for example. Imperial troops left the colony in 1870 and the colonial government was then encouraged to maintain its own defence forces. So there was a partial payment introduced in 1878 to the New South Wales Volunteer Force. And in this time period from 1883 to 1901, colonial armies grew from around 9,000 to 29,000 people. So if you're thinking about researching volunteer forces, the best place to look is the colonial secretary's records. So as well as the indexes and registers, we've also got some special bundles that give us returns of the volunteer corps. They give us details about the organisation and training. Um, there's a petition for members to continue as active members without payment of the old members. Um, certificates of entitlement for land grants for veteran pensioners. We've even got a muster roll from one of the companies. And then there are some registers of volunteer land orders as well. You can see details of the officers in the volunteer corps in the public service lists, which were published annually. So here we have an example of just that. So it's just the officers only, and you can see the public service lists on the opengov.nsw.gov.au website. I find the best way is just to do a Google search for public service list 1867, and then follow the links to the OpenGov website there. Here we have an example of the muster roll of Captain Wilkins from Company Number no. 7, the Sydney Battalion of Volunteer Rifles in the 1870s. So it gives us quite a lot of information. It tells us um, the name of each of those people, when they joined the volunteer force, what their profession was, their height, their age, whether they were married or single, where they lived, gives us their signature, and also tells us often when they resigned. So on this page, we can see there's quite a few teachers who were in that company. Now, the other thing that volunteer force officers and non-commissioned officers and volunteers were entitled to if they weren't as paid staff or receiving regular pay. After five years continuous efficient service, they were entitled to a free grant of 50 acres of land. So we have registers of volunteer land order selections and they give us information about the person who was getting the land. So they give us their name, what regiment they were in, and then also details of the land that they were granted and any correspondence. And the correspondence is sometimes held with us as part of the papers of the Lands Department. So you can try to trace that correspondence there. We would say there's no guarantee of success, but it certainly might be an interesting exercise to try to do that. And here, what we've got is a rare example of a certificate of efficiency itself. In this bundle, which is the Colonial Secretary's Bundle of Volunteer Land Order Selections, um, widows or volunteers were writing to the Colonial Secretary to obtain grants of land. In this instance, the certificate had been included in the petition to demonstrate the efficient service of the deceased service volunteer. So Mary Clarkson is the person writing the petition for this example. She was the widow of William Clarkson. He had been a soldier in Her Majesty's 50th Regiment of Foot and afterwards had served in the Naval Brigade brand, Band. He'd served 145 days in the Colonial Defence Forces Bandsman 
and then as a volunteer and he made three years, seven months and he had four years efficient service when he died. Mary was left totally destitute with the three children. She was requesting an allowance on account of her husband's service to the country. She included testimonials as to her husband's service, which is where the certificate of efficiency and that parchment certificate come in. And it's been, I've never seen one of those before, so it's a very unusual example, but amazing that we have it. Um, and she also included testimonials as to her own industrious, sober and honest character. So the colonial secretary ruled that the service was sufficient to warrant a certificate for a land order in this case. And he also suggested that some consideration on account of the time served afterwards of two thirds of the whole ought to be made in money to the widow and the three orphan girls. So it was quite a successful petition really. Here we just have the, a camp of military volunteers from the 1880s. So the other thing that the New South Wales government did was send contingents abroad. So to the Sudan, the Boer War and the Boxer Rebellion. So the first one was the Sudan conflict, which was in 1885. As a background, the, in the early 1880s, the British-backed Egyptian regime in the Sudan was threatened by an indigenous rebellion under the leadership of Muhammad Ahmed the Mahdi. So to support the British, a contingent, an infantry battalion of 522 men, 24 officers and an artillery battery of 212 men set sail on the 3rd of March, 1885. The men were mostly employed in railway fatigue work, although 50 of them were detached to form part of a camel corps. They arrived back in Sydney on the 19th of June, so they weren't there very long. And there's nine names on the Australian War Memorial's Roll of Honour for the Sudan conflict. And this is a picture of the tents in the Sudan. So quite an amazing shot from 1885. Where to look for the Sudan conflict records? Well, we've got a couple of special bundles from the colonial secretary, and you could also look in the Joan Rees index to convicts and others, words like the name of the individual or Sudan spelt either way, or contingent, for example. Here we have an example from the nominal role of the people who were sent to Sudan as part of that 1885 contingent. So it just tells us their name and their rank. So it's very brief information, but a name is a place to start. And then in the other special bundles, we've got some detailed information. So I found this wonderful map, which is showing the march from the Su Suakin to the Tamai on the 2nd to the 4th of April, 1885 in the Sudan. And then on the right hand side there, we've got copies of orders having reference to pay and promotion reissued by the commissioner commanding the New South Wales contingent in March, which basically shows the deployment of some members of the force to elsewhere within the contingent and what their rank was. We also hold copies of telegrams and correspondence, which include things like requests for food and guns, reports, and there's deep thanks and congratulations from the British government. This is an example of an amazing address to the soldiers of New South Wales. It's stirring and patriotic. Um, so for the first time in the great history of the British Empire, a distant colony is sending at her own exclusive cost a completely con equipped contingent, he says. And then on the second page, uh, just talking about the pride um, and the gratitude of England, um, the heroic resolve to uphold by your valour. You will be greeted in Egypt by the hearty welcome of thousands of chiv chivalrous soldiers and so on. And this address goes on for pages. It's quite wonderful. The next contingent to go was that that was sent to the Boer War. Now the war between the British and the two Dutch South African republics, the Boer War, began on the 11th of October 1899 when the Boers declared war on the British. The British government called on support from the empire and contingents were raised from all Australian colonies and in 1901, after federation, a joint Commonwealth contingent was raised. The war lasted until the 31st of May 1902 when Lord Kitchener and General Botha signed the peace treaty and there are 589 names from this conflict on the Australian War Memorial's Roll of Honour for the Boer War.
So where to look in the collection? I would start with our Bore War Records Guide, which is in our Research A to Z. And in there, the, paper, the records of the Colonial Secretary feature quite heavily. So there's photographs, regimental orders, records of salaries paid. And we also have a Royal Commission that was looking into claims of many of the officers and soldiers who'd served in the Boer War and believed they were eligible for higher payment than what they received during their overseas service. Here we have an example from the regimental orders of the New South Wales Mounted Rifles. And this, is, this book is almost everything for that particular regiment. There's detailed lists, lists of horses attached to the brigade, lists of officers and men's names and rank, their trade, age, religion, birthplace. There's reports of the contingent's casualties, their engagements, their skirmishes with the Boers. There's also an index to defaulters, which refers to a list of those defaulters. Um, and there's lists of men who returned to Australia or England, those that were killed in action and taken prisoner. So it's just everything. Here's another page from that regimental orders, and here you can see the casualties, the general engagements, the men who were at one of the outposts, and those men who were engaged in operations and those particular dates. So it's quite amazing. It's not indexed, it's not microfilmed, it's not digitised. So to view this one, you would need to come into our reading room and view it there. And here we've got a volume from the Treasury Office looking at salaries paid to the South African contingent in 1901 and 02. Um, and so that's quite interesting as well. So we've got the wives and other relatives receiving those salaries and the date ranges of the salaries paid there. And finally, this is just an, an image of the departure of the New South Wales Bushmen's contingent. Um, and it just shows you the support from the whole of the population there, well, the population in the picture anyway, that for that particular contingent. Another conflict was the Boxer Rebellion in China. So by the end of the 19th century, the balance of the lucrative trade between China and the West lay almost entirely in the West's favour. Anti-European secret societies formed and throughout 19, 1899, the militant societies combined in a campaign against Westerners and Westernised Chinese. By 1900 March, this uprising spread and Western powers decided to intervene mainly to counter threats to their territorial and trade ambitions. In June 1900, as a Western force marched on Peking, Chinese Imperial troops were sent to support the boxers. Further Western reinforcements were sent to China as the conflict widened. Australian colonies offered support to Britain in the form of naval contingents. And then the first naval con Australian contingents, mostly from New South Wales and Victoria, sailed on the 8th of August 1900. And this is the boat that one of those contingents sailed on the Salamis. So we don't have a lot of records in the collection about the Boxer Uprising, but I'd be looking in the Colonial Secretary's papers. There's also information in the Australian War Memorial, and there's a couple of useful publications. So the Illustrated Encyclopedia and the book Blue Jackets and Boxers and newspapers which are on the Trove website, the National Library's Trove website at trove.nla.gov.au. I did actually find a list of officers who were, appoint, were appointed to the Naval Contingent on the 4th of August 1900. So that's in the New South Wales Government Gazette. And I was also lucky enough to find a couple of reports which were sent back from the contingent to the Colonial Secretary. So reporting that they sailed, reporting that they arrived. And so they're quite cute little reports there. And the Colonial Secretary has just noted, seen. So, hmm, interesting. And here we just have a view of the contingent on board that ship that we saw earlier. So, Federation happened in 1901 in January. The six Australian colonies united to form a federation, the Com Commonwealth of Australia. A range of concerns such as the tariff, communications, transport and trade had strengthened the arguments for federation in the 1890s, but it was defence and immigration that finally brought the colonies together. 
at Federation, the function of defence was transferred to the Commonwealth Government. So if you think about it, up until 1856, it's a British thing. For 50 years or so, it's a New South Wales thing. And then after that, it's a Commonwealth thing. So defence is only really a New South Wales thing for a very short period of time. But that being said, there's plenty of New South Wales state archives that can inform us about our military ancestors during the 20th century. Life in the home front, the war effort and the returned soldiers. So in World War I, uh, Britain, Britain and Germany went to war in August 1914. Prime Minister Andrew Fisher's government pledged full support for Britain. The outbreak of war was greeted in Australia, as in many other places, with great public enthusiasm. And in response to the overwhelming number of volunteers, the authorities set exacting physical standards for the recruits. For Australia, as for many nations, the First World War remains the most costly conflict in terms of death and casualties. So from a population of fewer than 5 million, over 416,000 men enlisted, of which over 60,000 were killed and 156,000 were gassed, wounded or taken prisoner. In 1939, on the 1st of September, Germany invaded Poland and two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. Australia entered the war on the 3rd of, December, of September, following the British lead. When Japan attacked the American forces at Pearl Harbor in December 1941, Australia focused troops and resources on the Pacific War. Almost 1 million Australians served in the armed forces and over 27,000 Australians died while in military service. The war ended on the 14th of August 1945 when Japan surrendered, effectively ending the war. Now, the first place to look for World War I information would be our New South Wales Anzac Centenary website. So I've given you the address there, but you can also find it through our World War I guide. If so if you go to research A to Z World War I, you'll see a link to that website there. And it divides everything up for World War I, our records and information with in-service, which looks at the enlistment and response of the government and people of New South Wales to World War I. It looks at day-to-day -day life on the home front during the war years. It looks at how the war was commemorated in New South Wales in remembrance, and it gives us some research pathways for tracing stories of New South Wales soldiers and nurses. This photograph's just included because I really like it. So to me, this just says so much about the youthful hopes um, and the excitement that they must have felt these young boys when they were actually in Egypt, standing outside the Great Pyramids. It's just at that stage would have been an amazing experience in their lives, those poor boys. Now, if we think about first off 20th century government employees and military service, we certainly have a lot of records of government employees going off to serve in the military. We can find these boys and men in our online indexes. We can look in our catalogue. You can search by the name of a person. And you can also look at the staff records from various government agencies, from railways, education, border fire commissioners, public service board, for example. So our online indexes, probably our most important, would be our government employees granted military leave 1914 to 18. We've got a few railway indexes there. So the railways kept quite amazing records about the men and boys of their employee who went off to World War One. They had a nominal role and a role of honour. And there's also the indexes of the soldiers settlement era after the war. So if we think about that New South Wales government employees granted military leave, there are about 10,000 individual names and 13,000 entries taken from a variety of records. And these records included parliamentary papers, police salary registers, photographed honour rolls from the glass negatives in our collection and government gazettes. So you can search this index by name. So here we've put in the surname Davy, and we've come up with a couple of teachers and a, a labourer who worked for the railways. Now, if we go back to the railway records, we can actually see James Henry Davies 
employee card here, we can see that he was, um, he enlisted and he went off to war. So we can see that that happened to him. And then we can see that he's come back and he's worked the rest of his career with the railways as well. So there were provisions made for the railway staff. Permanent employees who'd been called on or had volunteered for military duty were granted a leave of absence. They were paid the difference between their wages as an employee and the military allowance while they were away. Their positions in the railways were kept open for them and their seniority was maintained so that on their return they could resume work as long as they were capable of performing their duties. Temporary staff were offered similar terms if their occupations were of a permanent nature or likely to lead to permanency. But we also know that 1180 state rail employees lost their lives in World War I and it was a very big employer in New South Wales at the time. So James Henry Davy worked for the railways for his whole life. He was finally fatally injured on the way to work on the 17th of December 1942. And we've got an inquest file about him as well. Um, and a compensation was paid to his widow, Sarah, and a refund of his contribution to the superannuation fund was also paid to Sarah. So James Henry Davy is also on the nominal role of the first Australian railway section. So here he is showing up in his index. And here is the copy of the page on which he is on the nominal role itself. So here's the second bottom entry there. It gives us his trade and calling, his rank, his whether he's married or single, which he's married, his address, his next of kin, and so on and so forth throughout the thing. So the majority of the nominal role lists those who joined the first railway section at the showground camp in Sydney. Um, and most of these people were from New South Wales, although a few did give interstate addresses. And the other wonderful thing about the nominal role is this group photograph of the first Australian railway section taken at the Sydney showground prior to departure to France in 1917. We also have the Roll of Honour, and this was printed in 1924 and provided details of railway employees who worked for the government railways and transways and lost their lives as a result of service in the First World War. Um, it included it, the name, branch and military unit of each person. Uh, and this is indexed, and so you can do a name search to see if you can find your individual. So if we're thinking about, say, Albert Clark, we can also then have a look at the railway's registers of deaths of officers whilst in, whilst in service. So this was a book kept by the superannuation board of the railways and listed throughout the war, all of those who died in active service and what their role was at the railways, what branch they worked for, how much they were paid and the date that they'd passed away. And these returns establish the payments owing to the officer's widow or the personal representatives in such circumstances. And here we have Arthur Henry Clark's railway card with that little, that sad note there. He's joined up in 1915 and killed in action on the 29th of May, 1917. Other government departments also honoured their military service people. Uh, so this is, from the Department of Education. So on the left hand side there we've got the record of service of Department of Education personnel in World Wars 1 and 2 um, and this was actually put together by the department. So you can see the book in its, all its corrections before anything else had happened to it. The entry there on Darcy Vincent Meek and his war service um, talking about when he went to France and being wounded, joining his battalion, being wounded again and everything, mentioned in dispatches for heroic actions. Um, and then he joined up again in 1940 at Fairfield. And on the right hand side there, you can see his teacher career card, which details basically the schools that he taught at, his salary, the dates he taught at each school and what his rank within the department was there. It also tells us that he enlisted, he resigned, and then he was re-employed by the department after the war was over. 
And here we have a public service board employee card, and this is a World War II um, kind of era card. So these cards cover 1911 to 68, but you do see more entries in the 40s, 50s, and so on for these people. So this is Sir Roden Cutler. The photograph there shows him as such a dashing and handsome young man. Um, he was our longest serving state governor between 1966 and 1981. He volunteered in May 1940 for overseas service with the second Australian Imperial Force. And he received a commission in the second of the fifth field regiment of the Royal Australian Artillery 7th Division. He served in Syria and performed some very dashing exploits before being seriously wounded in June 1942. And at that stage, his leg was amputated and he was medically discharged. And he received a Victoria Cross for his actions in Syria. He resigned from the public service, from the public trust office um, in May 1942 and on his return to Australia began a career in the Australian Diplomatic Service. Here we have a post-war volume of registers of applications for employment to the Board of Fire Commissioners and this volume gives us details about each of those people that had applied for employment but also gives us details of their war service and you find this quite a bit after both of the wars. Um, it was often noted that that person had served and the dates that they had served as we see here. Now another aspect of the military in the 20th century is the home front and civil defence. So where do you look? Well, I'd suggest looking firstly amongst the records of the Premier's Department. So we have letters received from 1907, special bundles from 1895 onwards, and also the indexes and registers of letters received. And the other source, of course, is our favourite, the Colonial Secretary's correspondence as well. And there's some amaz an amazing collection, we think, of untapped resources in the Colonial Secretary's correspondence waiting to be found. One example here from the Premier's Department is from the auctioneer um, a. a. Piggin. So the background to this is that the public reaction to war in 1914 was that of overwhelming jubilation and support. Loyalty was demonstrated by enlistment. So we had over 50,000 people enlisting in New South Wales by the end of the year. And the Premier's Department received letters from all over the state pledging support to King and Country. So this letter is one of those. It's from A. A. Piggin, an auctioneer based in Coroner. And he anticipated that the, the demand for horses that would be required for military use. So he printed and distributed 400 circulars dated 10th of August 1914. He wanted to locate cob and light horses which would be suitable for military purposes and his efforts were passed on to the Commonwealth military authorities by the New South Wales government. Now preparation for future war and the war effort was also an issue that was dealt with by New, the New South Wales government. So the states were still very involved in the war effort and the responses even though defence was a federal function after federation. So if you look at the records that lead up to World War II, there's very much a sense of preparation for future war and very much of lessons learned from last time. So an example might be employment. So the government was thinking about who would go to war and who would replace those employees while they were at war, for example. Another example is the State War Book, which was created by the state government. And this was in response to instructions from the federal and British governments back in the 1920s. Each New South Wales government agency received a copy of the State War Book, and this concerned emergency procedures for that agency in the event of a war or the imminent possibility of war, as well as general procedures to be followed in a crisis situation. So the State War Books were based on and were complementary to the Commonwealth War Book of 1939. We also have patriotic funding efforts. 
So during the war, New South Wales public schools were a central component of the war effort, engaging in these patriotic fundraising activities, and they functioned as a hub for local recruitment activities. They, schools provided grounds for rifle club, club dual purposes, for example, and schools were also some of the first places to erect the local honour rolls. And here we have a shout out to the boys from the Crow's Neck Public School who knitted socks to send to overseas soldiers in World War I. And they look very proud of themselves. In May 1935, the Australian government asked each state to begin making plans to protect their citizens against the remote possibility of chemical weapons, such as poison gas bombs carried by aircraft fly flying from a ship offshore. On the 1st of February 1939, plans were put into place when the National Emergency Services New South Wales began operations. So on the left here, we see a leaflet from the National Emergency Service for the public dated 1940, and it shows how to erect an Anderson bomb shelter in your backyard. And then on the right here, we've got a picture from the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So private property and parklands were taken over by the Commonwealth for the duration of the war for a variety of war related uses. In 1938, the pylons of the Sydney Harbour Bridge had been inspected to find the best places for fixing machine guns. And then in 1939, the anti-aircraft battery held training exercises in all four pylons, and the pylons were also used for troop accommodation. The gum platforms were added to the tops of the Harbour Bridge pylons in 1942, and you can see those in this photograph taken in January 1949. Now, the government was also involved in work in other states. So our collection includes documents and photographs showing the construction of roads, bridges and airfields in the Northern Territory, New Caledonia and Norfolk Island, along with wartime activities on the home front. The New South Wales government assisted the army to build a gravelled all-weather road in the Northern Territory from Tennant Creek to Burdum. Um, so they built a 139k section of road between September and December of that year. And so this is part of that road party on the left there, unloading machinery from a flatbed rail car at Burdum. Um, they were, the government was also involved in constructing the Norfolk Island Aerodrome. And this construction was undertaken by the government for the New South Wales, sorry, the United States Army Air Force and took place between August 1942 and February 1943. So we see some loading of equipment there and the difficulties thereon. The New South Wales government also helped to develop the Darwin Fire Brigade during World War II with the supply of hoses, fire engines, equipment and volunteer training. Now, after the war was over, there was a range of ways that we find records relating to the military who served during the conflicts. So we can think about soldier settlement, records relating to mental health, more mundane matters such as divorce, um, death records, so estates and probates, and also the commemoration of war. So soldier settlement up to around 40,000 servicemen and women took up the offer of farming land after World War I, but fewer than half remained on the land 15 minutes later. And after 1916, the Commonwealth was responsible for financing this scheme, but the states had to provide the land, classify applicants and train them. So where to look for soldier settlement records? You can look in our research A to Z under soldier settlement. We've also got some online indexes for soldiers settlement and you can search our catalogue as well. So you can search by the name of the soldier, the estate name and there's also the Murrumbidgee irrigation area files. So these were um, to do with the establishment of the Murrumbidgee irrigation area in 1906 and the Burrumjuk Dam which supplied water to the included in those files. And there's also the Soldier Settlement website, the Land Fit for Heroes, which contains case studies using sources held by us, and also some returned soldiers digitised personnel files held by the National Archives of Australia. 
Here's just an example of searching in our index for a particular name and you can see for James Graham Reed we've got some various soldiers settlement records there, mostly for this one area in the land district of Parks, but then there's also a second person in the land district of Dubbo. And so these files can give you such an insight into the difficulties of being a soldier settler at this time on this land, working this land that wasn't always the best land. Um, so here we have James Graham Reed with his soldier settlement at Trundle Land District of Parks with the estate name of Birds. He, here we see his application for a loan and it gives us details about his discharge from the military, where he was living, um, and some details about where the land was. Here we see some details of the improvements to the land that had already been made. So the house, the washouts, the sheds, the tanks, and the fences. Here we have details of his application for loan, the loan and what he wanted it for. So clearing and fencing, more tanks, a couple of horses and cows and some sheep. And then finally, we have a letter from him in 1924, where he's talking about the difficulty of farming this land, the successive bad years, the loss of labour. He didn't consider that he'd had much encouragement from the department. And by October of that year, 1924, the district surveyor reported that Reed had abandoned his holding and that the surveyor had taken possession of the remaining stock and plant. Reed had disappeared and the police were looking for him in 1925 and they tried to get in touch with his father-in-law, but even the father-in-law was unable to assist them to find Reed. So we're not sure what happened to him after that, but I do hope that life improved for him. Mental health is another aspect of um, post-war war service, as we're well aware of these days, but this was possibly around the time when they first started to really think of it. So Broughton Hall, next to Callum Park in Lilyfield, was used from 1915 for the treatment of returned soldiers suffering from shell shock and other nervous disorders. The hospital was administered by the Australian Army, and in this way, they could use military powers of detention instead of burdening returned soldiers with certification and its associated stigma. Broughton Hall worked in conjunction with Callan Park, which was just next door. There was a cottage in the ground set aside for soldiers and those requiring special treatment were admitted to the hospital itself. Responsibility for the treatment of mental disorders suffered by ex-servicemen was transferred to the state by mid-1920. Um, and it's important to note that patient identifying records are closed to public access for 110 years. So all of those post-World War and two, one and two records are still closed to public access. But if you are looking to access records of a particular individual, you can apply to New South Wales Health for permission to do that. And then you can contact us to help you with the research for that. During World War II, the facilities at Kenmore Hospital at Goldburn were made available for the psychiatric treatment of military personnel. So at that stage, the hospital was put under control of the Commonwealth government. And again, records of patients who were here are still closed to public access for 110 years as well. And again, you can contact New South Wales Health for permission to access those records. So, Thinking about divorce and estate records, the hurried war bridles only to end with not that much love once the husband came back from war and they really got to know each other as one example of a scenario. Um, there are the divorce files that cover 1873 to beg my pardon, it's 1976, not 1876. And you can search the catalog for divorce files by the name of each party and using the name divorce. And we also have in terms of deceased soldiers and deceased ex-military personnel, deceased estate files, probate packets and public trustee records. And these are all listed in the catalogue as well. So you can search by the name of the person. And if you're looking more generally, you could search for soldier, AIF, serviceman, 
ex-servicemen to find general records relating to soldiers. And a note about the public trustee deceased estate files, they are closed to public access for 100 years rather than the standard 30, which is the case for the deceased estates and the divorce files and the probate packets are open under an early access provision. So here's an example of one of our very favourite probate packets. This is for Cecil Robert Winch, who was born in Roselle and died at Gallipoli in 1915. He joined up on the 22nd of August 1914 when he was 22. Um, and his will, which is written on the back of a photograph, a family photograph there in pencil, leaves everything to his brother. Um, and we see there also the telegram that informs the family that he'd been killed in action. And then also the document from the AIF certifying that it, that had happened. Remember that picture that we saw earlier of John Francis Key, when we're talking about military employed, sorry, state government employees who went off to the military. Um, here, this young man was also killed in World War I and we have a copy of his will giving all of his effects to his dad who was living in the Isle of Man in England. This is a copy of records from his deceased estate file from the Public Trust Office and as it, it dates up to 1921 it's now open to public access. So we get particulars of John Frederick Francis Key himself. We then get details of the property that he owned in New South Wales. Um, and then that can help you to trace back to that land as well. And finally, finally, the government was also involved in commemorating those that went to war. So the departure of men and women from New South Wales into war service greatly affected those that were left behind and the lives that they led. In response to this, the people and the new government of New South Wales dedicated many memorials, monuments and honour rolls. Initially, there was a display of local pride to those that had served or were serving, but they were also used as an instrument of encouragement in the recruit movement during the war. And the monuments then served to commemorate service and sacrifice and to provide a place of mourning for those in Australia so far from where the fallen lay. Honour rolls and memorials were usually paid for by local committees, but some, some townships sought assistance from the government. Competitions were arranged for some of the proposed memorials with monetary prizes. So on the right here, you see an example of a town competition run in Tamora. And the winner, Bengit Tokanda, who also won the competition for the Korowa Memorial, was announced in the press on the 21st of December, 1920. So what do you want, we want you to take away from today? I think really the basic, basic message is that while we don't have a lot of service records in the New South Wales State Archives collection, we do have a lot of records that can help you trace your military. So, We've looked at records of the colonial secretary. We've looked at records in that period that New South Wales was responsible for its own defence. And then we've looked at ways that records in the 20th century can support service records held by the Commonwealth government. So I hope that we've managed to show you that there are certainly avenues of research in the New South Wales State Government Archives collection. And I hope that you would have some success if you tried to go down this road to search those records. So thank you for your time today and I hope you enjoyed this talk.